Okay, now we're going to talk about moving from monoliths to microservices. I call that mono to micro, just to kind of make it shorter. And we have a little bit of content in this area, and specifically there's some things that I think you'll be very interested in. Okay, now it should be noted that microservices are actually not for everybody. There's actually a great blog article by DHH, the guy behind uh, Ruby on Rails, and he talks about the majestic monolith. And in his case, his organization can produce to production their monolithic application every week, and they can move in one week increments. And we've seen other organizations that go that fast. They went from a three month deployment cycle, or two months, or six months, down to one week. And for their business, their organization, one week deployments are fast enough to meet the need. In this specific case, he felt that microservices are not for him. So I'd encourage you to read that particular blog article because that's a good way for you to think about it. Now also, Martin Fowler talked about the fact that you may not necessarily want to go directly to microservices architecture right out of the gate for a brand new project. A lot of people have been saying that. Oh, if you start Greenfield, just start with microservices right away. And Martin actually wrote a nice article about talks about, well, maybe you want to go monolithic first because you don't yet know all your requirements and you certainly don't know your bounded context, right? So that's going to be more on that in a second. But think about that. There be dragons down the microservices first path. So just keep that in mind. Also keep in mind that you're on a journey to microservices. If you've not matured along this evolutionary path and you still are waiting three weeks to get a virtual machine or your developers and operations teams are still in odds with each other and they don't work together to deliver the product together, you don't have developers yet on the pager, if you will, or maybe you don't have any kind of automation, whether it be around the containers or VMs or CI and CD, and you can't figure out how to do a blue-green to save your life or a canary to save your life, you probably don't want to go to microservices just yet. Because think about that for one second. You have a hard enough time deploying your one monolithic application every three months. It's hard to give birth to that baby every three months. And now you're saying, I want 30 or 40 or 300 of those babies to give birth to all the time without all this automation in place? I think you're going to struggle with that. and It's going to actually be very problematic. Now, Remember, we talked about all these properties. We showed you how to build microservices, discover them, invoke them, how to scale them, to make them resilient We're using circuit breakers and bulkheads, you know, how to run a pipeline, all those kinds of things. We talked about all those things too. These are critical to running your microservices at scale and happily in production. So let's talk about what it means to take a monolith and potentially break it up, okay? And at least talk about that. And if you think about it from the original architectural vision you had, when you actually sat down, let's say five years ago for this Java e application, or even if it's a big .NET application, or whatever it might be, Ruby on Rails application, you probably drew on the whiteboard a nice layered application architecture with the user interface separated from the business logic middle tier, separated from the data access tier, with a nice clean data model that, you know, the schema was super tight, you modeled it all, you spent months agonizing over these diagrams and pictures and thinking about it and trying different things, and you had a beautiful architectural vision. Well, it actually didn't stick that way. Over time, maybe it was perfect the first time around, but over time, as people got in there and maintained the code, changed things, or we didn't know about that business requirement, we didn't know about this new business partner, or this new regulatory change that's occurred, things start to kind of creep, right? Things start getting outside their boxes, and the user interface starts interacting with more than it should on the middle tier is a good example. And actually, the middle tier starts interacting with other components in the middle tier. And then other people start going after the database, maybe after pieces of the schema that don't belong to them. And it gets even worse, right? So we actually have a situation where now our user interface interacts with maybe a third party system, in some cases talking directly to a database, bypassing the middle tier, and it just gets crazier and crazier. So this is actually where our big balls of mud come from, from an architectural standpoint. This is where monolithic architecture is it's not the fault of monolithic architecture, it's the fault of not having good discipline over time. So just keep that in mind, because if this is what your world looks like, it's going to be fairly hard to adjust without getting that sorted out to a microservices architecture where you're just going to take your mess with you. You don't want to do that. So just keep that in mind. Some people love referring to the concept of evolutionary architecture. That's another ThoughtWorks principle, and I encourage you to read more about that, either by Neil Ford or Martin Fowler and, and the folks over at ThoughtWorks. Now, there is one pattern people love to apply and people love to talk about when it, mean, when it comes to addressing their monolithic applications. And it's known as the strangler fig. So this is a strangler fig you see here. 
and you can notice Martin Fowler also wrote about this, known as the Strangler application. The idea of the Strangler fig is pretty cool. Basically, a bird flies by and, you know, has a dropping, and that little dropping has a seed in it. The seed starts growing at the top of the tree because that's where the bird, you know, did his business. And the strangler fig actually will grow down the tree, and over time it'll completely compress and destroy the internal tree, and all you have left is the strangler fig. It actually strangles it to death is the idea. And the same thing applies to this monolithic architecture that you might decide to turn into microservices. Instead of actually going in and wholesale changing everything, perhaps just identify a segment of the application that can be turned into a microservice and just simply add it on the side. Okay? The idea that you had, add this one little microservice, it has its own unique database, its own two pizza team, it's completely independently deployable, its own independent governance model, et cetera, et cetera. They've got automation, they've got pipelines, they're taking advantage of Docker and Kubernetes and OpenShift as an example. And then you simply have your router, right, or your user interface interact with it too. So you basically have duplicated in many cases some of the functionality over here, but that's critical that you have done that duplication because you want to maintain your independence so you can deploy quickly. And so you keep adding on to that. Maybe it has yet another microservice it interacts with and maybe other microservices it interacts with. And over time, you surround your monolithic architecture with new clean code bases that are focused on the specific use case, specific business capability they have to. And those business capabilities may also be exposed to business partners, so we have another outbound route here. And then over time, you actually will shrink that monolithic application to the point where it's essentially nothing. That's the idea of the strangler pattern. It is much harder to apply than what you saw here in these slides. These things draw nice pictures because you got to think about all the cultural implications inside your organization, the organizational impact that you'll have, how do you reorganize the teams, reorganize the code bases, and more importantly, you have to decide how in the world you identify the component that gets peeled off and actually is part of the strangler. This is where domain-driven design comes in and the concept of the bounded context. So I mentioned here there's more advanced topics that will be available to you at some point in the future, but do go reading up on domain-driven design and knowing your boundary and the bounded context. That's how you know how to define your vertical slices in your application that could potentially be their own independent microservices. Uh, that's where those rules come from or those ideas come from. Other things you should consider in your microservices journey is how to deal with HTTP2 versus HTTP1. As an example, HTTP2 is super powerful from the concept of a bi-directional binary protocol as an example. Uh, gRPC is growing in popularity, but you can also think in terms of AMQP, right? So maybe gRPC or AMQP instead of HTTP as another network component to your overall uh, system, microservices architecture. Other things you should consider is feature toggles. The feature toggling frameworks that are out there, like FF4J and others, are pretty interesting. The idea is that you can have software components in production, kind of like the Canary idea again, but in this case, super fine-grained. The Canary, in this case, was the whole software build, right? The whole new image running in production. A feature toggle says, well, let me just change one label. Let me just change one piece, one button on the screen and turn that button on or off depending on uh, what I want from a business rule standpoint. Uh, A-B testing, of course, is related to that. You should definitely check out. A-B testing is non-trivial, by the way, and it's not canary deployment. A lot of people confuse the two, and it's not blue-green deployment. So if someone says, oh, I'm doing A-B deployments, do you mean blue-green deployments, or do you mean A-B testing? You need to you need to understand that one. A-B testing is really a business metric level capture. I'm trying to know if my systems are performing better from a business perspective. Are we getting more orders or getting less orders? Customers happier or less happy? Real simple. Um, Sidecars are growing in popularity. You're gonna hear a lot more about that over the next course of next several months, next several years. The concept of the sidecar and what's happening in the service mesh world is gonna be very, very interesting. And we could spend a lot of time talking about all these things, but as I said, they're more advanced topics that go beyond the scope of our original presentation and our original demonstration that's out there. There are lots of resources available to you. Again, make sure you understand what these links are. This specifically is a slide deck we've been walking through throughout all these presentations. And again, the demo that we primarily focused on, MSA Instructions, that shows you all those capabilities, but also the books. Don't forget the three books that we mentioned earlier. There's also another presentation that I encourage you to look at, and that is how the JVM blows up inside of Docker. So we actually show you how to kill Java 
via Docker, via Kubernetes. And uh, it's kind of a fun thing to go explore because you probably don't realize that your Java virtual machine will misbehave if not treated just exactly so. And very, uh, you got to treat it very correctly. Otherwise, it will just die as a good example. So uh, the other demos I showed, goodbye, cube for Docker also, and the Java Docker fails. So those three are the other elements that we showed throughout all this presentation. So thank you so much for your time, and hopefully you enjoyed this content that you saw here over these last several videos, these last several segments. And if you have any questions, feel free to reach out, me at, uh, reach out to me on Twitter at Burr Sutter, and also feel free to email me, burr at redhat.com. Thank you so much, and have a great day.